welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures to the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to join us live for a session sometime, you can join our weekly Control the Room Facilitation Lab. It's a free event to meet fellow facilitators and explore new techniques so you can apply the things you learn in the podcast in real time with other facilitators. Sign up today at voltagecontrol.com slash facilitation dash lab. If you'd like to learn more about my book, Magical Meetings, you can download the Magical Meetings Quick Start Guide, a free PDF reference with some of the most important pieces of advice from the book. Download a copy today at magicalmeetings.com. Today, I'm with Patty Dobrovolsky at Up Your Creative Genius, where she is the founder and chief activator. She is also the author of Nine Tips to Up Your Creative Genius, Drawing Solutions, How Visual Goal Setting Will Change Your Life, and creator of the Change Genie Cards. And I have them, and they're awesome. Welcome to the show, Patty. Thank you so much for having me, Douglas. I can't, I'm just so excited to be here with you. I love you. <laughs> I love what you're up to. I, every time I'm in some kind of room with you, I'm like, yes, things are going to happen now. So thanks for having me. Amazing. And, you know, if anyone who's listening can't tell, Patty has some infectious energy and... I think that's a big part of her style, and we'll be talking about that a little bit today. But before we get into all of that, let's hear a little bit about how you got your start, Patty. How did you get into this work? Well, thanks for asking. I was an actor, and then I got in a show that ended up on Broadway, and I was, like, fascinated. How did that happen? Because I had never thought of being on Broadway, but I spent a summer learning how to act. And the woman who I was living with was a Broadway actress. And so she kind of embedded this vision in my head of what it was like to be on Broadway and all of these things. And it happened the next year, like really, literally, I got auditioned for a part, it went to the main stage, it went to the Kennedy Center, and it went to Broadway, like all in this year. And I was like, Oh, my God, I held that picture in my mind. I imagined myself there. So that to me became like a mystical experience that I wanted to know more about. And then so I went on and had my life as an actor. And then I became a drama therapist. And then I was a terrible therapist. So I went into business where I could honestly tell people what to do and they wouldn't get offended by it. And so, you know, as a therapist, you want to be empathetic and you want to listen. And I just want to tell people, you you have a drinking problem. Get out of there. You know, that relationship's bad for you. Go. You know, all that stuff. So in one of the meetings I was in, an early meeting, because I wasn't a business consultant. I don't have an MBA. I saw a guy go to the board and draw a picture of what we were talking about. And at that moment, I realized that was what I was going to do. I wasn't an illustrator. I didn't know how to draw. I had good handwriting. I was poster girl in high school. So I started to do drawing with everything that I did. Like I, they'd send me in on these big change management mergers. They'd have fired everybody and left a few small group of people left over. And I would draw a picture of what they felt, what it felt like to be them and then where they wanted to be. And I just incorporated drawing into everything. And because I was a drama therapist, right, that's, I knew how to facilitate the room. And that, when I started to facilitate big groups of people or even small family systems that were having trouble making a change, I felt like I was right in my wheelhouse because I could get them enacting what it was, and then change what was happening. Wow, so much cool stuff there. I want to come back to the point you made around being an actress. And I know that the you know you were talking about the theater being a big part of your start. And you mentioned getting into theater recently and kind of experimenting with that some more. And I'd love to hear that story again. 
Well, I was really uh, never cut out to be an actor, quote unquote. I was more of a character comic. So I would, because I loved Lily Tomlin and that style, I saw her in a performance and I thought, oh my God, that's it. That's the kind of work I want to do. So I would write a show about a topic that I wanted the audience to have an understanding or insight about. And then I'd play multiple characters in it. And then I got in that show that went to Broadway, but after that show, I did some work of my own. And first I did it in New York and I got a really great review in a national magazine. And I was like, yes. And then I went to Portland, Oregon and did the same show. And the reviews were can't sing, can't dance, can't act, can't write, don't bother. And so I just totally shut down. I There was no way I was going to act again. I just couldn't do it. It was like, for some reason, I just broke and so I went back to school and got a degree in drama therapy. And honestly, I think I did that just to heal myself because about 10 years later, somebody asked me to write a show. I was in it about two women in perimenopause, and it became a hit and went to all the uh, small theaters. And so I, I think theater and performance, even as a facilitator, I'm in a room full of people. I always do something active. Like I just last week, I did a road rally with some engineers where they had remote control cars and drones. They had to drive them to the stations, you know, but at the debrief point, you know, there were yield signs and they had to debrief at certain points and it got boring, you know, just the regular debrief. Okay, now table one, table team B, you know, whatever. So I said, this time you're going to debrief in a scene. I want you to show me what it looks like when people are acting that way. And, uh, you know, the engineers were, at first they freaked out and then they all did it, you know, because we we naturally played when we were kids and all we're doing is tapping into that. And so I'm going back into the theater in this phase of my life because I want to go full circle back to that time because there's nothing to me that's better than standing on the stage telling a story, having the audience be with you in the story, and then coming to some understanding together. Wow, so cool. And you were telling me that as you were working on the new project, there was essentially some things that were surfacing for you. There, it was almost like a form of therapy as you started to working in this project? I'd forgotten about, you know, when you write your own material, you know, you're coming up with the story. Well, that's already a raw experience because you're going to tell a story and then will people like it? I don't know. But this time I'm writing a story about what it was like to grow up being gay. And it's not, I've taken it out of my story. So some of the stories that I tell in there and the people I play, these are real experiences, but I've, I've made it into a character, right? Right, so I can have a little more artistic license and it's not autobiographical. But when I replay, there's one scene where I am working in the Forest Service and there's a guy there who really, you know, now back in the day when I came out, like you, ne you, you had to be very careful who you told. And I worked in fire crew and there were only a few women working fire crew and I was just doing it during the summer. But this guy... You know, he was harassing me and he was pinging me on my hard hat with these little pebbles and he would just throw them ping, ping. And I got so mad, I picked up a handful of gravel and I threw it in his face and he scratched into my car the word lesbian. Mm. And so I tell a little bit of that story in the show and bringing up what had happened during that time and the fear, you know, that I, I mean, I was in a small town in, in the Eastern part of Washington, you know, you, they would come and kill you there. It was, it was not safe. Right. So bringing that up and sort of all the fear that I suppressed has been an interesting experience for sure, to say the least. Yeah. It sounds, you know, on some level, it sounds a bit, could be difficult and trying, but on another level, it could be a journey that uh, creates more awareness. Oh, and I would say it's very cathartic to go through mm -hmm. it. And then I see, oh, that's interesting. So this is the part of my personality that I, that I sealed over, 
you know, this is the part of me that would go into a room full of people, a predominantly, you know, I always worked at a high level in companies. So they'd be mostly men and the white men in that room. I'd walk in, but I'd put on this bubble around myself. And I always made sure within the first hour or half day to make sure that they knew that I was gay. Like it wasn't obvious, <laughs> but I would. And I was saying to you earlier that I thought it was a defensive mechanism because I, I realized I didn't feel safe, but boy, that made it kind of unsafe for all those guys too in the room in a way we couldn't drop down and have a real conversation because I wanted to make sure they knew that I was me and they were them and there was never going to be, you know, crossover, which always happened inevitably in the day there was crossover. But I wondered if I had made it harder. Mm, that's really fascinating. I mean, I, I, I certainly can't judge on whether it was harder then, but I can definitely say that there's been moments when I've made it harder and I've seen other facilitators made it more difficult. And that's something worthy to sit with, you know, how we're showing up as a facilitator with regards to how easy do we make it for people to connect with themselves and with us. So I think that part of what we want to do is that, and this takes skill and practice, and you're really good at this. This is what's true, is that you ask a question of the room and you're transparent about what your experience is. And you know, not in a way that you're dominating the room with your experience, but you're asking them to be able to sh tell you the truth so that from the truth, we can all come to a bigger and better place with what's happening. And I think that's the world that we're in now, right? That we, we want to find truth. And so, but we don't know sometimes what truth is. And so we push it away, the conversation when we really need to have the conversation in my area, you know, with the neighbor who has whatever political affiliation that they do or belief that they do. My goal really now in my life is bridge to that conversation, bridge to that state of consciousness so that I can invite them and I can walk across the bridge to meet somewhere in the middle. So when we were talking about this earlier in the pre-show, something that you said was pretty profound as far as self-awareness goes. And you said, I was afraid of what might happen. And that is, I think, a big struggle that a lot of facilitators have, especially when you're new to facilitation. And even when we're experienced in facilitation, there are things that might throw us off, right? Yeah. I was actually facilitating on January 6th, and it was right when everything was happening, when we were kind of kicking the day off. And I remember, you know, in that moment, I was dealing with my own emotions about it. Yeah. Also trying to like read the room and I was uncertain. Like I didn't know these people that well. So, and it was virtual. So I was like, yeah. I kind of took the safe road, which I thought was the safe road and said, okay, let's not fixate on this. Let's move on. And it turns out those folks were pretty upset by it and wanted to spend more time on it. It'd been a lot more powerful if I would have said, you know, how's this sitting with everyone? Do we yeah. want to talk, sit with, do we want to talk about this or do we want to move on? Like give them the options. I think in the moment, because I was personally struggling with it so much myself, I didn't even, you know, it was, I didn't even do the right thing. Well, I think it's hard to know what the right thing is. So it's interesting. On 9 11, I was working at Chevron Texaco. They had just merged, and I was training the HR team uh, at the leadership level in how to do good change listening in the room. And that happened. And I just will say that the whole day it stopped and started and stopped and started. And what I learned from it was you could do both. I could have them air their discussion and talk about it, but it was also important that we use what we were working on to understand it better. And that went fine, but I wouldn't say it was a great day. You know what I mean? I just... Mm. In retrospect, I think I would have just shut down the session and had everybody go home, <laughs> you know, to yeah. be with the people that they loved. 
And, and we don't know, you know, I just think you don't know because in that day I was paid by somebody else. I'm paid by the client and the client, if I had said, well, I just sent everybody home, they'd be like, well, that was not good because now we can't invoice for that day, you know, like that. Yeah, you know, certainly as a outside facilitator, we had to worry about the bean counters as well as the people yeah. in the room. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I want to come back to, you You mentioned the word family systems earlier, and then you also talked about, you know, this history of experiencing a delightful individual that liked to throw pebbles, yeah. and then how there was a part of you that was kind of protecting you from the future pebble throwers, potentially. So it made me think of the family systems framework, and I was wondering yeah. if that's what you were mentioning when you were talking yeah. about these family systems earlier. Yeah, I was. And, you know, I was trained as a drama therapist. So I really, I worked with Virginia Satir's material. Oh, I worked okay. with a lot of different people. And one of the great mentors of mine, Jonathan Rosenfeld, he and I later worked together in the business sector. He was a coach for the head of Twitter. And they had an offsite where we really did some great work together. And one of the things that I know is that and I would always say this to people, you know, wherever you go, there you are. You're always bringing your family dynamics into it. So you just have to figure out who's who in the dynamic of whatever you're experiencing in the room. And then once you know that, you'll understand what's getting triggered and you can work together to move through it. You don't have to tell them what it is that you're going through necessarily, but you can say to them, gosh, I reacted because you were in that moment, it triggered something that I experienced with my mother. And I'm so sorry. Let's have that conversation again. And my favorite um, technique of all times in my relationship and everything is the drama therapy eraser. So when you're having a conversation with somebody and it doesn't go the way you want it to, you just stop the action and you say, okay, do you think we could use the eraser right now? And I'm just going to erase this last 10 minutes and we're going to start again. And then you do, you just start the conversation with whatever line you started with, and then it goes the way that you want it to. And I think it's, it's very reparative and you can't be afraid to redo something, especially if you're the one that's making it go badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that's uh, that's amazing. I love this idea of the eraser, and I can imagine it being a really powerful tool. I love these little tools that we can pull out in the moment, these little micro tools, right? It reminds me of Elmo. You know, yes. <laughs> or, or I was in Hawaii or whatever these little things that teams use to help them get through moments. And wow, what, a, what an important moment to get through when there's like, hey, wait a second. Yeah. Neither one of us are proud of this. Let's just erase it. Let's let's pull out the eraser and just start over. I love it. Well, and I like this thing that I learned from Sonny Brown, which was the evil stick of gum, you know, and uh, I wrote it on my whiteboard, evil stick of gum. And then somebody came to my house and they were like, evil stick of gum. What's that? And I'm like, well, it's a technique where you can actually get, let people have the evil stick of gum and they can say whatever they want to say, as long as it's not pointed at somebody, they can say whatever. And then the truth is out, right? And that's what we're talking about is how do you uncover the truth underneath the, in the root system of who we are? You know, we carry all this stuff. And if we don't start to talk about it, what we're afraid of or what's happening in the dynamics in a team, it, it's just not as fun. And, and what's true is I love to have fun. Like I'm committed to having fun in the room. And that's what I'm known for is creating a fun environment where we do wacky things and I'm loud and obnoxious and funny. And, you know, I bring everything that I was as an actor right into the room when I'm facilitating because I love people and I love them to remember you're in this world, but you're not of it. So let's play. Mm -hmm. Let's play. So good. You know, I was recently watching an awesome video from a researcher at Stanford talking about how they think that play is homeostatically regulated. Wow. Have you heard of this? No, I love this, though. Keep talking. So it means that just like food, we get hungry for it if we don't get yeah. enough of it. Like breathing is a little different, right? Breathing, like you just do it like 
autonomously, <laughs> right? You just yeah. you just breathe without thinking about it. But yeah. like eating takes like intentional effort. You had to go grab the door of the refrigerator, open it and shovel food in your mouth, you know? But you get hungry if you haven't eaten in a while. So yeah. your body regulates this need for hunger. And play is, is similar. It's not this thing that we just grow out of or that it's nice to have as a kid. It's something that we crave as humans. And yes. and the body starts to long for it. But I think what happens is the systems and structures by which we live through stifle it. And so we just push it down. Sort of like what you were talking about earlier, pushing these things down until yeah. you just cover it up and you don't notice that hunger anymore. We've starved ourselves so long that it, we're just kind of numb to the hunger. Yeah. You know, there's a great book out right now by Norma Kamali. And if you don't know who Norma Kamali is, she's a, a fashion designer. And when I lived in New York City, you know, one of the biggest days of my life was the day when Grace Jones walked by me down the street. And Norma Kamali to me is like Grace Jones of the fashion world. She's just really deep. And this book, she talks about how important it is. She said, if there's a dance party, I'm there. And she's 75. And I'm telling you, she looks like she's 40. She looks incredible. And part of it is because she's taken care of herself enough and, and really fostered a relationship with the people around her and danced and played and eaten well and, you know, all of the things. And I think this is, you know, we, we, we sort of uh, got on the ladder and the ladder went up to the corporate money machine, right? And I always call that working for the man. Whenever I feel like I'm working for the man, then I know I'm not in the right space. I'm not really doing what I love. I'm not really playing in the environment. I'm just working to survive or to make money. And that is absolutely not the right way to live your life because then you're just waiting for retirement. And then when you retire, your body's not in the same shape it was earlier. So it's so important to take time to play right now, to take time to do the things and find the things you're passionate about right now and do them. And, you know, it's not only things that we do in our leisure time, we can play professionally. Yeah. And I think that quite often people equate play with childishness. And if we can rethink how play happens, it can really unlock quite a bit. Yeah. And I, uh, the CEOs that I love the most are the ones who really are playful and who are allow for that kind of um, consciousness to, and exude it and demonstrate it and show how you can do it. You know, I think it's, it's, especially if you're in, uh, you know, responsible to a shareholder, you think you have to, it has to look a certain way, but in fact, it's better if you just look your way, <laughs> just be mm -hmm. you. It's so much better. You know, I was thinking about the internal family systems and as you were telling some of the stories there, and it reminded me of this working model I have around meeting calculus, which is, hmm. you know, you've got two people in a meeting and it's just one connection. Right. You got to be mindful of. Well, you get three people in the room and now there's three connections. You only added one person, but now you've got two additional connections. Yeah. You add another person and now, you, you know, these connections start to explode exponentially. Well, it didn't dawn on me until I was just listening to you that if we take internal family systems into this calculus, <laughs> it's even Think more, of how many people are in the room. Right, because each person's yeah. bringing a whole yeah. constellation to use yeah. their terminology. That's why when you start a meeting, it's so important to ground yourself that you're in the room and that this is an environment you're entering into to have mm -hmm. a dialogue about something. And that the more that you can show up authentically and be aware of what you're saying and doing and respectful of other people, you know, then it changes everything. And I think one of the greatest things I learned from Lois Todd, one of my early business partners, was the, the point of setting your intent you know, she was an NLP person and she taught me so much about mirroring the room and mm. listening and, and elevating the things and the people that were not being heard. You know, it was just a, an amazing experience to be a collaborator with her. So, you know, and so many other people, but uh, I love this idea that you understand that you bring so many people into the room. And if you know that and people know that, then you can change that. 
I want to bring us back to the robots. And when you asked folks to act out what it looked like, you said that you experienced a little bit of hesitation, but then after a moment, they all kind of just fell in line. How would you describe that hesitation or, or, or what was it that, what were they kind of working through? And then how did they end up manifesting those behaviors? I think it'd be really interesting <laughs> to visually kind of see that in our heads. Yeah, well, um, you know, this is a group of engineers I'm asking to do this. They weren't actually engineers. They're project managers in an, in an engineering firm, right? And so one of the things that I knew and know about people is that to perform is really scary for them, can be. But if you, if you lower the bar to the ground and you say anything goes and just have fun, with this and let's, and I'm going to give you a very simple equation. One, you're going to imagine that you're taking on that this action plan, you've put it in place and it's been successful and show me what that looks like. So I'm very specific. So they don't have to like, um, they know what they're doing, right? They're just debriefing what they've already discussed and they're putting it into a scene. And so you make a simple equation for them to follow and then you start by applauding right off the bat. I'm like, and now here's what's true. You know, the, the two flaws that we, we have in a system is we turn our butt to the audience. And so nobody can hear what we say. So everybody face the audience, number one. And number two, applaud always before they start. And we'll start it with action and cut. And that way, you know, the scene doesn't go on and on. It can only be a minute long. We're just getting a snapshot. And everybody can step up to that. And everyone has to participate. So nobody, you know, they can't default. The three of us are chairs and they're a person, you know, talking, right? They, everybody gets into the action. And it was shocking and surprising and fun. And I videotaped every single one of them and sent it to the director. And she was like, oh my God, that's hilarious. I go, yeah, see? And they did that. Amazing. I love it. And, you know, it's like just nurturing, right? And supporting. Yeah. It's, it's great leadership. I think that's a great example of how facilitation skills need to find their way into leadership more and more, right? Because not every leader is going to be running sessions where the team's acting out these different scenarios, but gosh, if they could learn to be more supportive, more encouraging. Well, yeah. And even, even if they learn simple tricks, like write something on a card, have people choose it for like a deck of cards and then you know, gamify whatever it is, any meeting that you're having, even if it's an all hands meeting, make it fun for people so that you don't know what the order of the agenda is going to be that you're going to do. Mm. They're going to, they're going to choose by choosing the card. This is what I'm going to talk about first. You, you make it into a, a more spontaneous thing. And spontaneity is the moment you're in your best self. You're in your essence as soul, right? You're in an experience. And your natural capacity and your natural skill is to imagine and play mm. and draw and draw. <laughs> I mean, drawing is what we all know how to do, even if we're not good at it. We know how. We know how. You know, that's really fascinating. When you say you're in your essence, when you're kind of in that spontaneity, coming back to the internal family systems, is there a guardian or a person or a part or one of your family members active when you're in that state or or is that stuff suppressed and it's more you actually showing up you know the moment when you're in the state of flow right where you're out of the way and the flow happens mm -hmm. that's that's really what happens that's your natural yeah. state of being and that all the other stuff the personality the family systems the a belief about what you're capable of. That's, uh, you know, the structure, the covering of you, of yeah. who you are. And that if you can unpeel that and be that and give, I think, give permission to other people to be that, you know, like uh, what's true is I have on my bathing suit underneath this shirt that I'm wearing right now, because as soon as we're done, I'm going to go jump in the pool and then I'm getting out and I have another call right afterwards. But part of that is because I want it to be fun for me. I want to have fun with just myself and so that I bring that to the conversation. And if you can connect 
to the part of you that loves to play, no matter how it is, whether you get on your bike or you're playing with your kids or you're playing with your dog. This is the essence. This is the essence of true love is when you're in the state of free flow play. Wow. Amazing. I want to end right there. And I want to invite you to leave our listeners with a final thought. So here's my thought. The next time that you are getting ready to put on yourself, when you're getting up and you're going into your day, stop and ask yourself, who's in here? And how can I connect more with that person, that self, that part of me that is able to express and do anything? anytime. And then see if you can go into your day with that perspective and invite the play into the arena. So incredible. Patty, it has been such a pleasure and I'm saddened to bring this to a close, but every close is an opportunity for a new opening. So (laughs) I uh, am excited for your dip in the pool and (laughs) we'll talk again sometime soon, I'm sure. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Douglas. You're amazing. Thanks for everybody for listening. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. If you want to know more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about radical inclusion, team health, and working better. VoltageControl.com.